Welcome back to the Cricket Smile podcast brought to you by Maca Media. Today's a great day. We've got our first podcaster on to join us, Owen Terry. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm very excited. Did not expect to be invited on, but I'm very pleased. You are a bit of a specialist when it comes to statistics, numbers and narratives per se with soccer. Yes, yeah. And I've brought you on because you've just started your own podcast, Numbers and Narratives. We'll leave a link in the description talking about the Euros and what's going on with the Euros right now and some of the hidden statistics behind some of the games. And it's actually really interesting. I really enjoy it. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoy it. I think sometimes when it's uh, people hear numbers, they might not think it's really interesting. But I, I think it's like just getting evidence to back up some thoughts or theories that I might have. And I uh, hope people find it a bit interesting and learn a thing or two. So right now the Euros, at the time we're recording this, the knockout stages are going to begin in the next couple of days. Yep. And so far, what have you thought of the Euros? I think it's been great. We've got a lot of stoppage time goals, um, which has met, led to a lot of late drama. Um, one thing that I found really interesting, going into the numbers a little bit, is that I'd heard before the tournament started that the market value of teams uh, doesn't really dictate who's going to win the game. Whereas in club football, if your team's worth more money, the players are worth more money, they're a lot more likely to win. And so we've got teams like Romania, who's worth 92 million, which sounds like a lot of money. I'd like to have that. Versus the squad of Belgium, though, who had who were worth 584 million. And Romania actually topped a group with Belgium. And then you've got Croatia, who were worth 330 million, and they didn't even get it out of the group stages. So it's been really interesting to see that some some nations that are the quality of the players don't seem as strong as potentially other other teams, but they've still managed to find a way to to get over the top and get past them. Do you think that's because all the players are all playing in their country, so they're used to playing with each other a bit more? They've got a bit more chemistry. I think that's definitely part of it. That there's probably a lot more cohesiveness with those. Um, smaller teams that they're, they're probably less spread out throughout the whole world rather than all playing in the top five leagues. Some players in France, some players in Germany, some players in Spain. Everyone from Romania probably plays in the Romanian league. and With Andrew Tate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they might sub him on when they need a goal. Well, one of the things I found really interesting when listening to, I think it was episode two of your podcast, was talking about how winning doesn't guarantee international titles and for example, Portugal in 2016 in regulation time of the matches was one and seven, but won the Euros. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So what's going on there? So pretty much in in club football, um, so that's like your Liverpools, your Man Cities, et cetera, they, they used to be quite defensive as well. And then there was a change in football that instead of getting two points for a win, it became three points for a win and one point for a draw. And what that meant was it was three, you're three times as like, you got three times as many points for winning a game rather than drawing. And that meant teams would push on for attacks more and try to win games a lot more. Whereas in the Euros, you can just get away with drawing every game. Um, so you don't, and rely on extra time and penalties. It's a short tournament, so you can just rely on luck. You don't need to be a lot better than the opposition and really push for that winning goal like you do in a Premier League match or La Liga or any domestic league in club football right now. Do you think that with teams like France, Germany and Spain, that is a, a thing that's not good for them? Like that doesn't help their luck in terms of the Euros tournaments because they have such better teams? What it means is if, if you're... If you're an attacking side, like which Germany and Spain have been, um, then there will be more goals. You're less likely to draw, but you're also more likely to lose. Um, and with that, if you, if you lose a game, then you're knocked out. There's no, you can't rely on extra time. You can't, you can't rely on penalties. So that's the concern for those, those top nations. If they're going to push for goals and really try to win the game outright, then they might c get unlucky and concede a goal and that leads to them losing. So that's why Southgate and England look like the worst team out there because yeah. they're so defensive. That's right, but they still top the group and they're playing they're playing terrible, ugly football, not but stuff that we'd think would work. But it would does. work, yeah. And if you look at um, 
the stats by Opta, and that's like whenever you see something like an Instagram post that says supercomputer says that this team's going to win, that's just this website, Opta. And they actually have England as their favourites to win the whole tournament, uh, which, you know, by the eye test, England are playing really boring, terrible football. But the stats say, well, actually, they're a reasonable chance of winning this still. Well, I found that really interesting how on, I think it was the first episode of your podcast, you were talking about how defensive teams win international games. Mm. And I think you said four teams that have only ever won the Euros that were attacking teams. That's just because there's not as much time for teams to repair. You're not playing 38 games like in a Premier League season. This is only a maximum of seven games for each team. It's really short. So there's not much time for much tactical cohesion to happen. It's a lot easier to get a defence set up and um, have have your team playing good defence. It doesn't take that much um, tactical genius. It's it's pretty easy to do. But with attacking, it's a lot more. You need a lot more complex structures to offset the defence, and that makes it a lot harder for attacking teams to to set up and get get really good football playing. Um, and then the other thing is what we we're kind of talking about before that you might be more likely to win games outright by playing attacking football, but you're also more likely to lose outright. So in 90 minutes, you might you might deserve to win. You might have 20 shots and the opposition has 10, but they could score one of those. But if you have 10 and the opposition has no shots, you're not going to lose the game. Well, I've been watching a few of the games and some of the highlights, and one of the things I've noticed, apart from Germany's first two games, is all of the really good teams... The games have been really boring. Like they have not yeah. been exciting. All the powerhouse countries, France, Spain, Italy, England, Germany, none of the games have been that exciting, minus Ger- bar Germany's first two games where they absolutely demolished Hungary and what was the first Scotland. team they played? Scotland, yeah, that was not good for Scotland. No. <laughs> but it's almost been that the lower tier teams playing each other have been the exciting matches, like... Serbia and Austria and Denmark and those sorts of teams. Yeah, I, I really love Aust- Austria, especially from that group that you've mentioned. Um, and I think that's because they have to try something different. They have to to do something different to try win the games because they're not as good. So they just they can't rely on playing the same way as everyone else and just doing it worse. So Austria are really interesting because they um, they really look to press the opposition's um, defenders when they get the ball. And what that means is they might cause turnovers high up the pitch and get them really good chances. But if they get it slightly wrong, which it's really easy to do because you don't have much time to set up this aggressive defence, it means that teams can play through the Austrian defence and then get a really good um, chance on their goal. So that's what we kind of saw with Netherlands, Austria, where Austria ended up 3-2 winners. But um, I think statistically they're, they're, they create like the second best chances per shot, but then the ones they concede are also the second second worst. So that's just that end-to-end football because they defend so aggressively means that they get really good chances and they concede really good chances and it makes it really fun to watch. Because they probably have the better attackers and better strikers, but do you think there's a lot of pressure on the managers to play defensively because of that or do you think they have more pressure to play offensively because they have the better players? I think if we look at Gareth Southgate and the criticism he's received over his time as the England manager, he's actually done really well if you look at it in a more objective sense no cl- um no nation has matched his results um at world cup euros and uh world cup yeah so in 2018 he got to the semi-finals of the world cup in 2020 he made the final of the euros and then in 2022 he made the quarterfinals of the world cup and no no other nation in europe has matched those i mean france have won a World Cup and got to a final, but in the uh, 2020 Euros, they only made the round of 16. So he's done really well, but he's done it playing boring football. And then the fans say, we've got all this attacking quality. Why don't we play more interesting football? And why don't we play more fun, exciting attacking football and get the best out of all of these players, which might not lead to more success, but that's what the fans think will. And it's also what they want to see. So I think that there is a bit more pressure on the top um, managers to to play more attacking football, but at the end of the day, results decide whether you keep your job or not. With the Euros this year, do you reckon there's any dark horses? Like, was it 
Iceland a few years ago. They went really far into an international tournament where the coach was like a dentist or something. Yeah, it was it was a bit crazy with Iceland. I remember reading up on them um, in the 2016 Euros and it was like, oh, well, they'd just be happy that they got out of the group and that's that's all. Sorry, that they got to the Euros. They're not going to do anything. You know, if they got third place in their group, well done. Um, and then it turned out they actually got out of the group stages and they played England and they beat England 2-1. <laughs> Which was pretty crazy, and it wasn't just that the manager it was a lot of the players. The player was, I think, the goalkeeper was like a cameraman or something like that. Uh, there's was, there's was a lot of crazy figs going on of that Iceland team. Um, in terms of this Euros, it's a bit it's a bit hard to say. We've got a few teams go through that it's a bit unexpected, like Georgia, um, Slovenia. I think has only got a population population of two point two million, and they've got through Romania. So there's a lot of them. I think. Austria, the most exciting team, um, they're perhaps more of a dark horse. I think they're probably the most likely to make a real, real run at it um, just because they play a different style of football that other teams aren't used to in international football. Well, there's one group that has, I think it's Romania, Netherlands, Georgia, and there's a fourth team in that group. Is this the group where they all finished on four points? Uh, no, for the knockouts, like they're in this oh, round right. of 16, right. round yeah, of 16. The, there's, and there's no, apart from Netherlands, who's kind of on the cusp of a higher tier nation, there's no um, top tier teams in that path all the way until the semifinals. Yes, yeah, yeah. I actually, yeah, so on one side of the draw. I've I got think, it here. Yep. So yeah. it's um, Romania, Netherlands, Austria, and Turkey. Mm-hmm. So th- that bracket of four teams will go all the way until the semi-final. Yeah. So if any of those teams were to make the semi-finals, they'd be considered a dark horse. But yeah, exactly. But it's got to be one of those teams because those four are the teams in that round of 16 bracket. Yeah, yeah. It's it's so interesting that's how the draw falls because if you look at the other side, I'm pretty sure that f- arguably the five best uh, nations in the tournament are all going to face each other before the final. Yeah, so Germany, Spain, France and Portugal will all play each other by the semi. Yeah, there you go. So it's <laughs> it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a crazy tournament, and it makes it more fun that it can, you can see that you get to see big big nations play against each other earlier in the tournament, and then you'll see uh, nations you wouldn't expect to go really far have the chance to to potentially win a Euros or at least make a big dent and go really far. Well, what do you think of Ronaldo and Portugal's uh, quest to the Euros? redemption path so far because they won 2016 by a bit of luck yep. maybe i watched that game i stayed up for it where they played france and france just missed open goal after open goal after open goal ronaldo gets injured goes off and then portugal scores some miracle goal from some random striker that you've never heard of yes. before from outside of the box and you don't hear about him again afterwards um do you think portugal have a chance of winning again I definitely do think they have a chance of winning again. Their their squad on paper is really, really good. Um, and they don't even start Cancelo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they've they've got a lot of quality. It's it's hard to it's hard to imagine them losing when you just look at the names on paper. But that's <clears throat> not always how it, it turns out. Um, and I mean, they lost to Georgia the other day. They did they did rotate quite a few players, but that's. That's just what can happen. You never really know how it's going to go. Um, in terms of Ronaldo specifically at this Euros, he's he's been a bit of a mixed bag because he the main thing he provides at this age is is his goals and contribution to the attack. And he's been a threat the whole Euros. He's had the most shots without a goal. He's gotten into the third most dangerous spots without getting a goal. Um, so he's just been really unlucky. He he normally is a pretty decent finisher at goal, but he is causing a lot of problems. And I think if he can get going, then it's gonna make it's gonna bring a lot of confidence into the rest of the team, and that's gonna uh, help their chances a lot more. After seeing his start, would you to the Euros tournament? Would you start him, or would you still bring him off the bench? So before the tournament started, I personally thought that Ronaldo should have came off the bench. Um, this is, it's mainly because he doesn't really contribute much defensively, which you can kind of hide a bit more in international, international football because yeah. you don't need to be as aggressive um, with your your front two attacking 
uh, players when you're defending. So someone like Ronaldo, you can kind of hide defensively. But I still thought it was a little bit unideal. And um, he had also been playing in Saudi Arabia, which isn't as high of a quality competition. I didn't know how he was going to go playing here. And I thought he had a lot of strengths that could be brought off the bench. But based off how he's been playing, he's been playing pretty pretty decent. And he's So it's it's I don't think it's worthy of dropping him over the form that he's produced. And you kind of you want to get as much cohesion as you can in the team. So I wouldn't be f- switching around the magnets now that we're in the knockout stages just because he hasn't got a goal. Um, he's just he's just been unlucky. So even though personally I wouldn't have started him from the start, I think he's gone well enough so far that you wouldn't drop him based off his form, even if he hasn't set the world on fire and been the Ronaldo we expect. Well, he's thirty nine. Yeah, he's getting up there. And he's, it's it's a bit crazy that he's still he can still jump five times higher than I ever could. It is, <laughs> <laughs> but watching it, it almost looks like his teammates aren't servicing him that much. Like they've almost been told not to pass him the ball. Sometimes, like you could see he's like doing the one two touch passes and going in for the run, and then players aren't giving him the service that he normally gets. Yeah, yeah, it can appear that way sometimes um, when things aren't going. Of players' way, then maybe the players are thinking that he hasn't scored yet. But I, I think, I think that they, that he can't. He's always been the guy for every team he's played for. That screams for the ball every that time. That screams for the ball. Yeah, that he's always got it. And now perhaps it's probably not been as much. You've probably got other players that are around the same quality or better than him, which hasn't been the case before. Whoa. <laughs> at, um, at his club of Portugal, um, so he's probably not getting perhaps quite as much service as he used to. But I don't think that um, there's any plan from the Portuguese players to say, hey, let's not pass to Ronaldo anymore. He's passed it. I think uh, I think they're mature enough to give him the ball when he's needed. And he makes good runs. So I'm sure we'll see, see him get the ball a bit more as the tournament progresses. Well, what do you think of his move to Saudi Arabia? I found it um, a bit surprising at the time, but... It, it kind of makes sense. He's He actually has quite a big following um, in the Middle East because he'd been... He has a big following everywhere. <laughs> he does, he does, but specifically in the Middle East because he'd been quite pro-Palestine. So there was there's a lot of money that he'd been given um, to go there. I think there's all the reports, something like 100 and f- it was somewhere between 143 million pounds per year or 315 million pounds per year were the reports that I found. So like salary aside. So yeah, that was that was just his yearly yearly wage in in Saudi Arabia. And then you imagine all of the advertising money he gets. And sponsorships. Yeah, and, exactly. But do you think it's tarnished his legacy or you think it's he can do what he wants because he's accomplished it all? I think it's interesting how you said it tarnished his, his legacy. I don't think it has. i I don't think it has because he's he's still been playing well there. I think that's something that might have affected a few people's um perception of him is that he's been so good for so long and he's evolved his game so much and people don't really know that as well maybe they do but they probably don't acknowledge it enough that wingers didn't used to be expected to score goals and get assists and whatnot and Ronaldo was a big reason for changing that that wingers were expected to score goals and get assists he was kind of the first guy to do that so at the start of his career his goals and assist numbers weren't that great and he, but he also took on the players. He he dribble a lot more. And then as he got older, he had to adapt his game. He he couldn't play from the left to get pick up the ball, dribble, get past people. And as he's aged, he's just changed how he's played, evolved his game, evolved his game to suit his older style. And now people just see him as purely as a goal scorer. And that's not always been the case. And that that may have tarnished it for for some people that they think of him as just that and not all of the other great things that he brings to the table because he's played for so long and the player he was for the past five years was not the player he was 10 years ago. But I think specifically the move to Saudi Arabia has, hasn't has um, impacted his, tarnished his legacy. He's just been so great for so long and people people know that, that it's hard for him to, to do anything from now to heavily influence it, I think, even if he's going to a lower league or not playing quite as well. But perhaps he's he's changed his play style people think that that's what it was like his whole career it's almost like lebron with his early career the amount of times he'd drive into the paint instead of settling for a jumper 
Whereas now he's worked on his jump. He drives into the paint. They're still very good at it. But the percentages, like he just had his best three-point percentage shooting year, I think, in a decade. Yeah. And he's 39 and he's still topping his team in points per game, all of that. And it's just crazy to see how the best of the best adapt their game as their body changes. And I think, as you were saying with Ronaldo, that's really interesting how he has adapted his play style to his physical attributes but still found success with it year after year, year after year. And I think that's almost what um, differentiates the best players in the world from the elite players in the world is their ability to adapt and stay the best player no matter what's being thrown at them in their um, circumstantial environment. I think that's a great point. And you look at um, a lot of players um, such as Felipe Coutinho, who's my personal favourite player ever. Liverpool sold him for $150 million to Barcelona, or 149 And um, he was playing really great football as a number 10, so attacking midfielder. And then the attacking midfielder position was kind of being f- phased out of the game or at least being the perceptions of what was needed for the role had changed. And then he couldn't get a game wherever, wherever he went and he, he's kind of fallen off the face of the earth and that's, that's not just been him. James Rodriguez was a similar player who wasn't able to adapt his game and go, oh, okay, th- this skill set isn't what's needed for this position. I need to fit into a new skill set. I need to change my game and bring something else to the table. Um, Mesut Ozil was another one that, that um, got phased out because he wasn't able to adapt his game enough and that's not to say that they weren't great players. But that's per- what stops them from being the best players. But Exactly, yeah. Well, the ronaldo Messi debate, I know we've talked about potentially going into that. Yes. But one of the things you were telling me about that I found really interesting that I'd love for you to share is the situational factor for whether you're a Ronaldo or a Messi fan. Yeah, so I could look like an idiot here, but I've got to, I'm going to try ask you a few questions and see if you find think this is very important or not super important to you. And this will dictate if I'm and a Ronaldo this, or this, Messi fan. This, this stat suggests that it would. So it could go wrong, but hopefully it doesn't. We'll see. All right. So would you say goals and assists are something that's like a big, big part of a, a big influence for whether you think a player's better or not? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, if, is advanced stats something that you'd really consider? Like some things like expected goals, expected assists, um, like, I don't know, successful dribble percentage? No. No. Uh, team performance and trophies that they win, do you think that's that's an important part, a really important part or not super important? If the player plays a pivotal role in those trophies, yes. Okay. The clutch moments, is that super important or not that important? Absolutely. The legacy you leave behind, would you consider that super important or not that important? Oh... I'd say so. I, w- I would say yes. You'd say it is super important? Um, I'm 50-50 on that one. Okay, okay. And like your individual performance consistency like day in, day yes, out. Yes, yes, that's important. Okay, so from those those stats, goals and assists, Ronaldo supporters are likely to consider more important than Messi supporters, which you said. Advanced stats, that's more Messi supporters. Team performance and trophies, that's more Ronaldo supporters, which you said. Clutch moments, Ronaldo supporters. Legacies, also Ronaldo supporters. And the individual performances, Messi supporters. So most of the ones that you said align more with what would be a Ronaldo supporter. And I am a Ronaldo supporter. And then you are a Ronaldo supporter. And there's actually like lots of really interesting links you can make. Um, Because the thing is they're both so good and they have different things that make them really good. So... um, People can find an argument either way for who's who's better. A lot of it has to do with your your upbringing and things like that to, for why you perceive certain things to be more important than other things. And so you can draw lines that are really crazy that seem completely un, unrelated. Like um, if you're pro-abortion, you are <laughs> right. Yeah, you are I'm a lot. You. you are a lot more likely to be a Ronaldo fan, which is completely unrelated on the surface, right? <laughs> But the thing is, if you're right-winged, you're more likely to be um, pro-abortion. Yeah. And 
the right wing people are a lot more likely to believe in stats such as the goals and assists, clutch moments, and the trophies and legacy to be a lot more important, which align with Ronaldo fans, which is crazy to think that these two unrelated things could make you a lot more likely to go one way or the other. Is pro-abortion right wing or left wing? Oh, sorry. I messed that up. <laughs> anti-abortion. <laughs> anti-abortion. My Whoa. bad. Anti-abortion, you're more likely to be... If you're anti-abortion, you're more likely to be a Ronaldo fan just because a lot more Ronaldo fans are right-winged. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, that yeah, some of you that I found interesting. Maybe other people don't just think it's weird. <laughs> well, another thing I was looking at is what's the best league or tournament in the world considered the most elite top tier tournament to win? Uh, well, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, and I think it depends like how you look at it. Cause I think the tournament that every player and fan would want to win the most is the world cup. But I think that that is a tournament that has a lot of luck in it because it's really short. Um, so you could argue that maybe it's a champions league, but even the champions league is a shorter format than a domestic league season. Um, so you could, you could say it's the World Cup, you could say it's the Champions League, or you could say it's like the Premier League. And to me, all three, all three answers are, are valid and can be considered correct. But um, I'd, I'd probably say the World Cup. Damn, I was hoping you'd say the Champions League because <laughs> Ronaldo's won five Champions Leagues to Messi's four. Yeah, But yeah. I found an interesting stat that Messi, on average, once in the last three years, every three years has um, been eliminated by Bayern Munich in the Champions League. So Messi was eliminated in 2013, 2020 and 2023 by Bayern Munich in the Champions League. And then Ronaldo is the opposite. So he's averaged every three years, one time in those three years to eliminate Bayern Munich. So Ronaldo in 2014, 2017 and 2018 knocked out Bayern Munich in the Champions League. <laughs> but isn't it? Isn't it interesting there that you've, in your the stats that you've prepared, <laughs> what you've acknowledged is the goals, which is what we talk about with Ronaldo supporters. It's what they they push to, and the trophies with with the Champions League, and which is also kind of like the big moments. Yeah. Uh, and it's it just links so heavily into that that idea. And we we didn't discuss this beforehand, so it's just unrelated that it just happened to be. Another thing you were telling me about before this was Liverpool getting in stats to win games. Yes, so yeah. So it's almost, it sounded a bit like, have you seen the movie Moneyball? It is a bit like that, yeah. <laughs> it is a bit like Moneyball. Um, not quite the same extent that they were working on such a small budget, like um, I forgot what team it was in that movie. I love the movie. Camera boy Rob, can you search up Moneyball <laughs> team in the NBA? NBA? Oh, in the N <laughs> NBA. MLB? MLB, that's it. No <laughs> acronyms. The Oakland Athletics baseball team. Oakland Athletics. There we go. And actually, interesting. Thank you, camera boy, Rob. Sorry. Interesting that you mentioned Major League Baseball because um, the the general manager of the Oakland Athletics. Um, Brad Pitt. He was, <laughs> Brad Pitt. <laughs> he was tried, even at the end of the movie, he's tried to be recruited, recruited by um, the Boston. Boston Red Sox. Yeah. And the owner of Boston Red Sox is also the owner of Liverpool. And so, oh. so they, they are really into their Silver stats. Lining. So there you go. Um, and to, to give a bit of a money ball perception, it's not the exact, it's nowhere near as much, but still. So the net spend since Klopp arrived, which is about 2015, Klopp's Liverpool, was Liverpool's manager. Shout out Julian, he'll love this. He's a Liverpool <laughs> supporter. So net spend is essentially... Um, you take all of the players you transferred in and you take away the players you transferred out. So if I bought you for a hundred million and I sold Rob for 50 million, <laughs> See you that, later, would, Rob. that would mean my net spend is 50 million, if that makes sense. Yep. Okay. So Liverpool have spent 350 million net spend, Man City 630 million net spend. Criminals. Chelsea 1 billion net spend, May United 1 billion, Manchester, oh, sorry, Tottenham 570 million Net spend. What about the Gunners? Don't have the Gunners on me, actually. So maybe they're, they're below. I should have got them. My bad. <laughs> but but um, it's it's a way smaller budget that Liverpool are working with. And if you include the wage bills of the clubs, the gap only gets larger um, between the amount of money that they're spending. But 
And even though when Klopp took over, Liverpool had finished the season in eighth, so they were not in a good position, they've only Man City have won more trophies since. Um, and, and there's question marks. And they're criminals. So. There's question marks over whether they're all legit titles they've won. Um, and then some examples of this, they bought, they, they, they really, what they did with their transfers, they, they thought there was an advantage in the statistics that people weren't quite looking into enough. And so they bought players like Sadio Mane for 30 million. And according to transfer market, his value was 150 million in, in 2019. Sales bought for 35 million, was worth 150 million in 2019. So they really, they really found um, some players that were perhaps being undervalued by these stats models um, that other teams weren't looking at. The rest of football has caught up now uh, quite a bit. That there isn't as much of advantage from stats in that sense. But Liverpool views stats in some really intelligent and clever ways. Um, one way is um, so a bit of backstory for this one was I don't know if this was the exact time when Liverpool decided to start doing this, but it it seems relevant to bring up that Liverpool once lost. They won the title next season, a few games into the season. They played Aston Villa. They lost 7-2. Three of these goals were major deflections. So a defender tried to block the shot, it hit hit a leg or whatever, goes into the goal, and there's nothing the keeper could do. Um, the expected scoreline, would have, if, if both teams are shooting average, it should have been about 3-1. So Aston Villa got really lucky. 3-1 to Liverpool. Uh, sorry, 3-1 to Aston Villa, but... They lost 7-2, so it was still quite lucky that Aston Villa scored over twice as many goals. So what Liverpool started to do was block the ball far less than the rest of the competition. So what that meant was the keeper got a uh, far better side of goal. Sorry, the keeper could see the shot from a lot further out, and there was less deflections where they had enough, there was nothing they could do. So Liverpool were blocking about 15% of shots, and the next highest was about 26%. So Liverpool blocking two to three times less than the rest of the competition. And instinct, intuitively, you'd think, well, that's stupid. Why aren't you blocking the ball? But they found in the stats that they should be blocking the ball less and they'd have more success. And they didn't quite get the title, but they nearly won um, in 21-22, I think it was. They nearly won the, or 22-23, they nearly won the Premier League, Champions League, FA Cup, League Cup. They were one game short of the Champions League, one game short of the Premier League. And a big part of that was that statistical analysis that other teams wouldn't have looked into. And I'm a Liverpool supporter and probably had a bit of an influence on me being so interested in stats. So, yeah, that was, that was a couple of things on Liverpool that I found quite interesting with the stats. I hope. <laughs> bit of a Liverpool fan. A bit of a Liverpool fan, yeah. My dad um, named me after a Liverpool player, <laughs> Michael Owen, who's not liked by many at all. So I hope I've... I've Turned you know, it done, around. Done some good for the name. <laughs> to finish off, you, you've started a new podcast and we briefly mentioned at the start numbers and narratives where you go into this sort of thing. And to me, I have no idea why you're not doing sports journalism <laughs> and you're doing accounting when you, you're able to talk about all of this and go into this sort of depth of analysis around statistics and football and you literally have your own podcast talking about it. But what, what's going on there? Why, why have you decided to start numbers and narratives? Oh, I really appreciate that, Kev. So thanks for that. Um, the reason why I think uh, we started Numbers and Narratives, I think in a lot of media it's it's about sa just saying big headlines like, oh, this this player didn't win the they, – they didn't win the game because they didn't want it more. And we want to provide real analysis that you can actually learn, learn a thing or two about football hopefully from. So the idea of the podcast is – you, you watch it and you listen to it and you come out of it and there's something interesting you can tell your friends or talk about with your friends and you feel more informed and it's not it's not just um, you know an analysis that isn't that isn't really real like you, you get that a lot with American sports it's not just Came, clickbait for the media exactly. and trying to get people just to watch and it's not actual substantial content you actually have substantial content and that's what we see with like the Ken Corns and Stephen A. Smith it's, it's good in parts but I think it's become a bit oversaturated and the real analysis isn't there quite as much um, and so I provide the numbers side of side thing as you might have been able to tell from this podcast and Ezra's really interested in the narratives and and um so he's he's my other co-host, and we we thought that this is something that we could provide that perhaps other 
other podcasts, especially in Australia, aren't providing that in-depth analysis that, that we could. And um, it's for us, it's as long as we get a few people that are willing to listen and find it interesting, um, we just enjoy hanging out with each other and <laughs> talking about football. So that's that's the inspiration for numbers and narratives. But, if, yeah, if anyone wants to... Yeah, we'll definitely leave more, a link to it in the bio or description of the video. Definitely check it out. I've been listening to it and I personally am a big fan of it. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> I um, told so many people about that defensive thing with the Euros, how only four attacking teams had won the Euros. and Oh, that, that's just what I would love to hear because, you know... You, and the regulation time thing as well. You come up... Because I, I had... I thought, oh, it seems like winning isn't as important as people think and then you look into it and you find stuff to back you up and then... You, f- you hope that people find that interesting hearing it and they're, they're going to talk to other people. So I'm so glad to nah, hear that I, you've I, been I, passing that information on to I don't know. People. Maybe it's because I really enjoy sports and I enjoy those sorts of things. But yeah, I found it super interesting and I'm, I'm wishing you all the best for the future, man. I hope the podcast does really well and I hope it keeps going the way it's going because I'm you've got a new listener in me and I hope that a few people today have enjoyed this episode oh. and go check it out for sure. Thanks so much. I've been loving your podcast as well. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Let's not. Oh, uh, yeah. We won't go too far. We won't go too far with it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thanks very much for coming on. I really appreciate it and wishing you all the best for the future. Likewise. Thanks for having me.